Hello and welcome back to Cool's Interviews. Today we have a very special guest, Steve Alton, best-selling author, as you can see in the video itself. Tons of books he has written, some of my old-time favorites, including Locke, Shell Game, and of course the Manx series. So let's join the interview now as we learn some other places outside the books you may have heard of him from. I started the movie career with uh, the Meg being in... Uh... Uh, theaters in August of uh, 2018, and uh, they are about to start pre-production for Meg 2. So um, it's either through my books or the new movies. Yes, and the movie was exciting. We got to go to that. We actually, I won your um, Instagram contest. And me and my friend Jeremy got to go see it, and that was, that was a lot of fun. So. Well, that's great. Where did you see it? Uh, in Colorado, um, at the IMAX theater here, IMAX Nine, I think is what it, Colorado IMAX Nine, Colorado Boulevard. You know, that's the one. That's the one thing I did not have a chance to do is see it at IMAX. So I'm hoping it comes back. It, it was good. Um, so, like you said, you start off in books. Um, I uh, I picked you up probably about 12 years ago. I found your first meg book read it in four hours and then uh, while i was waiting in the airport to go to arizona i read the trench um so what made you uh go from that to make like the digital like movie idea that you've gotten with sea monsters cove well i've been writing books for the last uh 23 years and and um you know the tough part about writing books and, and making a living from it um is that you never know if you're going to sell the, the book. You have to write it back, and then you hope that a publisher will buy it and give you enough money that you can live off of. So, uh, you know, I've had huge deals. I've had small deals. Uh, the Meg books are, are usually big sellers, but um, some of the other books are not. So it makes it, it makes it a little difficult to plan, you know, for certain things as you get older. And uh, this idea for Sea Monster Cove came to me uh, in December this past year. And I didn't want it to be a book. I wanted it to be a TV series. And then as uh, we started developing the idea, I realized there was so much more to this. Because what I really wanted, what I've always wanted, is to be able to see these sea monsters myself for real in, these, in a huge aquarium uh, where they weren't confined like orcas are on SeaWorld. They can just, you know, I know it's a crazy dream, but uh, with 3D animation, we were able to make it happen. So Sea Monster Cove is sort of a combination of a TV series, which I'm writing, and we we, we filmed episode one now. We're, we're in post-production on it. Uh, these uh, virtual visits to these huge aquariums at Sea Monster Cove, which we designed, and have these incredible monsters in it and, sh and big sharks. And then the, uh, the other idea that, that goes along with that is um, we're developing a new uh, video game where you get to capture the sea monsters yourself. Awesome. So everything sort of parallels the same concept. Well, that's awesome. I'm excited for that. Um, we're gonna dive into Sea Monsters Cove tomorrow, a group of us, so we can really take the whole day to look at it and give our review but from what i've heard it's great so i'm excited like so the early trailer for it was like angel like a big meg and now it's more of like a mako like a prehistoric mako what was the how come it changed from the one to the other well Megal megalodon is always the first go but um you know when i sold my rights to warner brothers uh that includes all rights. Anything that I do in the future that has to do with the Megalodon, you know, it goes to Warner Brothers. So we, what I did was uh, we looked at um, other sharks and uh, pieced together something from a legend, uh, which is called the, uh, the Black Demon Shark, which is in, uh, reported to be in these huge sharks in the deep waters off the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And so this is a prehistoric cousin of it, a Mako, uh, they're almost as big as Megalodon, but they're much faster, and their teeth are actually a lot meaner looking. So, Mako, 
Yeah, magos are nasty predators. So to find a 60 foot uh, prehistoric one is, you're not gonna be bored, let's put it that way. No, I'm excited. I, I just didn't know, like, I figured it might be something with the movie and, you know, I've done book stuff, so I, I understand that, you know, once they own it, they own it. Um, but I've also seen like Dunkleosteus and stuff like that being featured. Um, what you featured in Hell's Aquarium, if I'm not incorrect. Well, it was it was in Hell's Aquarium, but it wasn't featured. It wasn't. It's not a main character, and it's yeah. not on the series, so that's fine. Going forward, like, how many of these creatures do you plan on going, or is it just like time will tell? Or well, it's kind of an interesting formula because the episodes on the, the TV series will actually dictate what we capture and what we put on uh, display. So that if you're a member of Sea Monster Cove and you're visiting every day and you watch the TV series, you're actually being part of the TV series in a sense. And um, we've got some other things to get uh, members involved as well. But as far as the number of sea monsters, we're, every month we're going to add a new uh, aquarium to it. If you look at Sea Monster Cove, you'll see Sea Monster Cove itself is um, six spheres that surround a major a main sphere, which is the hotel and access points. And that's where we, we keep all the sea monsters. The sharks, the prehistoric sharks, are kept at something called the Oquarium, which is a, a different facility. How long does it take you to put together these episodes as far as like writing each one? Well, the process is sort of to get the beats down and then the treatment for it. And once I have that and I'm ready to start running, it doesn't take long at all. Uh, because things sort of flow from that point. So I could probably crank out a 22 minute episode in three or four days. Okay. And I already know the answer because I follow your Facebook page and stuff. But for anyone watching that doesn't know, does this connect with the Meg series at all? No, this one doesn't. Like I saw James Murr on there. Can we expect more celebrities throughout I, too? Yeah, that, that really worked out well. He, Turns out that, that James uh, is a fan of mine, and I had my one of my publishers gave me his new book uh, called "Don't Move" about a giant spider. Okay, and, <laughs> which is scary. Uh, they asked me to read it and give a blurb on it, and I really liked the book, and it was very good. And, and gave him a blurb, and and then he contacted me and said he's a big fan of mine, and it, so we sort of uh, have become friends now. And and he. Uh, he did a great ad for Sea Monster Cove, um, which uh, I hope will go viral this weekend as it, it gets on his site. So, but he he did an amazing job. He let it all hang out. He went for the Oscar. <laughs> he did good. We get some more celebrities like James will be doing well. Yeah, well, we'll definitely try to help spread the word as much as we can. Um, I've tried with your other books. You know, I I try to review each one I read. I see the lock behind you. Uh, can we expect any giant eels or anything like that in Sea Monsters Cove? Uh, I don't think we're going to go with the eels there because that's sort of Loch Ness, and and that and that movie's going into pre-production. Well, actually, it's in pre-production. It's going into production in 2021 as well. Okay. All right. So the animations look really good, um, really smooth. They look realistic um, from what I've seen so far. Uh, how much input did you get on that versus the movie? Well, that's the great thing about it, Keegan, because, um, you know, once I sold the rights to Warner Brothers and they also they also purchased a screenplay that I had written that that we helped use to raise some of the money. Um, you know, that's it for me. It's the authors aren't really involved in, in the in the production of the movie. And you know, that's fine. They've got some terrific screenwriters and, and amazing producers attached. So I'm not I don't have a problem with that. But I still, you know, especially when you, you compare the book to the movies, uh, I had no problem with it. I loved the movie. I really did. I thought they did an amazing job. But some of my fans wanted to see an albino megalodon. Some of them wanted to see more blood and stuff like that, more of an R rating. And I understand. But uh, this, the TV series puts me in charge, and I'm not going to replace myself. <laughs> so it gives me an opportunity to... Uh, show what I can do and, and to turning into um, uh, turning the novels into something that I think people will really enjoy. 
Yeah, no, I mean, anytime you take a book to a movie, there's always differences. Uh, like, if you read Jurassic Park and then watch Jurassic Park, it's like two separate things. Uh, but the movie was great. Um, it did really well from what I was reading. Um, so how, with this next one coming up, do you know if it's going to follow the trench at all? or? Yeah, it will, it will be following the trench. Um, probably 70% of the trench, like Meg did. Uh, but the movie did really well. It was number one in the U.S. and number one in the world. And they grossed over $563 million. So uh, before the movie came out, there were critics who were saying, who never saw it, but they, they were basically predicting that it would bomb. And I knew it wouldn't. I knew there's so many Meg fans out there, so many Shark fans. And uh, I knew that they would support the movie. And plus, we've been waiting 23 years to see it. So, But yeah. I, think, I think this next one's going to be a lot darker. The first one was more family-oriented, if that's such a thing with a giant shark. But this one's going to be a lot darker. Because the book was a lot darker as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I liked The Trench was really good. I really enjoyed that one. Um, but... So outside of the series and stuff, what else can people expect from Sea Monsters Cove? I know I saw like a library and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a really cool library. We call it a private library because um, uh, all my novels will be in there. No charge. You can read whatever you want. But they're all um, special editions of my novels with, with uh, color images inside. Okay. So, uh, oh, enhanced. Looking for They're enhanced novels. Which makes for a lot different kind of reading experience because you're reading something and then you're seeing a picture of it as well. And uh, you can you can get any of the books; uh, they're all free with the membership. That's my scripts. My my scripts are in there too, which have never been read by the public. So I think you'll enjoy them as well. Oh, I can't wait for that! I did not know about that. I see an eagle's blanket behind you. Yes, you do. They're in first place. Do you think they? I mean, I feel like they should win that division. What about you? Yeah, they'll t I believe, they'll take, they'll, you know, barring any bad injuries, they've already had so many at this point. But, um, yeah, I think uh, they'll they'll take the NFC East. There you go. I just had to get that in there. <laughs> so you said the first one's already done. How quickly do you think you'll get to the second one? I know with COVID and stuff, it makes filming a little bit harder. Um, what's the expected time rate with that? Do you know at this moment? Or? Well, we're, we're working with something that uh, we may get involved with, you know, a Netflix or one of those uh, companies. And uh, if they become partners with us, then that will make it go a lot quicker because we'll have, uh, you know, more money that we can put to production. Okay. But the people at Sea Monsters Code will always have the exclusive first look at the, at the uh, episodes. I'm super excited to dive into that. So after your last book, what, what's your next book on the horizon that people might be able to look forward to? Well, I've been working on uh, the, the Lock 3, uh, Heaven's Lake, and I hope to get that one done probably around uh, Christmas. And then we're, we're actually, this is a book that my publishing company is going to publish just for the hardbacks, like we did with uh, Make Generations where you could not buy Make Generations in hardback in the stores. You could only buy it through my website. And we did that because two reasons. I wanted to do something special for my fans. Give them a book that I signed every edition. Uh, they're, they're supreme hardbacks. Everything that you can possibly put in it is in there. Special signature pages and... Um, uh, you know, the, the value of them has gone up uh, a lot because we only printed 4,400 of them. And now you can't get them. And so so makeheads are selling them on eBay for like 150 to $200 a piece. So if you want uh, a copy of The Lock, Heaven's Lake, you have to pre-order it at www.stevealtson.com. And that's the only way you can get it. It won't be in stores. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. I got that one pre-ordered. The Lock might be one of my all-time favorite books, like, period. Like, Great Gatsby, The Lock, uh, Rant. Like, it's it was awesome. Like, I couldn't stop reading it. 
And I loved how you put little details of the different experiences throughout, like the different encounters people had. I thought that just brought to the realism. And w so with the latest news that they did the DNA testing in the waters and they found eels, obviously that's something if people have kept up with you, that's been your idea. Um, what what brought you to that conclusion when you were writing the lock? Well, I have a friend, uh, Bill McDonald, who's a forensic uh, artist, and he's also a, a um, cryptozoologist. And he's been out to Loch Ness many times. Bill, before I started working on the book, because it, my manager had suggested I write a book about the lock, and I I sort of didn't want to do it because I thought it was like the Yeti and the bomb, uh, the uh, Bigfoot, you know, sort of silly. But uh, once I started doing the research, I realized that there's there's two things that are going on in Loch Ness. The, um, the tourist industry is making a fortune out there on the belief that this is a plesiosaur, which is definitely not. That's absolutely impossible. It cannot be a plesiosaur because they're 65 million years old and they were, and they were marine reptiles. So if they're breathing air, then we would have seen them, even if they could be, you know, 65 million years old. But there's definitely something down there. And so my cryptozoologist friend showed me his theories and, and I felt he, he nailed it. Now I need to go back and research what he did and research the history of Loch Ness and find out how all these things happened in the last 80 years, which I did. And then 15 years later, uh, the, the University of New Zealand uh, as you mentioned, did the deal and, and proved us both right. That was great. I know for so long after I read the lock and people would ask me, because we do a lot of paranormal stuff, and they're like, what do you think's in Loch Ness? I'm like, well, not a plesiosaur, because like, we've had no evidence of any art bias or anything like that surviving. But I'm like, read read the lock, and it will all make sense. Like To have a giant eel like that that gets landlocked and gets bigger, it made so much sense to me. What is something that people like recognize you, maybe outside of the Meg, what's your most recognized book that people tell you is their favorite or whatever? Uh, the Mayan Trilogy, Domain, Resurrection, Phobos. Um, believe it or not, that's actually, that was actually a bigger bestseller in, in internationally than Meg was. Okay. And what happened with that was, um, you know, I wrote, a domain is about the Mayan 2012 Doomsday Prophecy. I was way ahead of the curve. I wrote it back in like 2002, or I'm sorry, uh, 1999, and it came out in 2001, 2002. But um, it, it just did okay domestically. Didn't get a lot of advertising for it or anything. It was still 10 years before 2012 events were coming up. Around 2010, 2011, a, a, a Spanish publisher bought the rights and sort of uh, played it off of the movie that was coming out 2012 and sent the book skyrocketing uh, into number one in Spain. And then it was number one in Mexico, number one in Argentina, and then it was bestsellers throughout Europe. And so that book is, to answer your question, that book has sold more copies. Uh, they sell it under a different name. It's not domain uh, internationally. It's called um, The Mind Testament. Oh, okay. El Testamento Maya in Spain, in Spanish. That's interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, so my favorite from you outside of the lock, which I said earlier, would probably be the uh, the shell game that you did. I really enjoyed that one. Do you ever think you'll get do another like political thriller like that ever again? or? Uh, not like that one. That one took a lot out of me. That's when uh, the Parkinson signs started coming out when I was getting death threats and and people would, you know, e you know, I was so, people were screwing around with me. Um, you know, they knew my identification. They knew my personal information. They, you know, they were pissed off. This was back when uh, Bush and Cheney were still in office. And and you know, if you read the show game, you know that. Um, a lot of 9-11 truth and real evidence is has never been accounted for. So um, I was flying way above the radar with that. Um, one of the one of the major um, sources of information for me was uh, Crossing the Rubicon, uh, which was a book written by a former LAPD officer. 
And uh, I read his book, and, and when I finished my book, I contacted his attorney and, and said I wanted him to read it. And so I sent him an advanced reading copy, and, and um, uh, he read it uh, in three nights, and he said, I, I need to meet with you. So he flew down to see me, and, and we talked for three days about strategy, what was going to happen to me. So, you know, when you write a book of fiction, but you mean it, it, the book was meant to be a Trojan horse, that, that the truth would come out in fiction. Why fiction? So that, you know, they, they wouldn't be threatened as much. But um, so to answer your question, no, I, I don't think I'll be doing another one like that. And so you talk about like some issues with that one. Did you have any when you wrote Undisclosed? <laughs> yeah, I did. As a matter of fact. <laughs> you wouldn't think that, but uh, yeah, Undisclosed is, it has its own backstory because um, probably uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was writing Phobos, as a matter of fact, the, the third in the mind series. It, there's an extraterrestrial part of the book that um, I started doing research on. And during the, my phases of research, I was I came across uh, Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer's uh, two-hour special that really had witnesses come up. He's probably the most famous and well-informed uh, person for extraterrestrials and, and um, UFOs. And so um, his, uh, I watched his two-hour special, and I contacted him and asked if I could have permission to use excerpts from his eyewitness testimony as part of the uh, chapter breaks in Phobos. And he said, fine, no problem. And uh, when I was done, I sent him a copy of the book. And his wife read it, and she really loved it. And, and so they contacted me and said, listen, we're, um, we're coming down to Miami in six months. We want to meet with you, have dinner together. So three nights, this is, I swear this is true, it's in the book. Three nights before we're supposed to meet with Dr. Greer and his wife, my wife and I are coming home from... Uh, you know, a date night, we had, went out for dinner in a movie. And as I'm driving through my neighborhood, I'm looking up in the sky, it's about 11 o'clock at night, and there's these eight to 10 lights that are flying across the sky very slowly, and they pass over us and we see the, the uh, outline of a saucer, a saucer-shaped sh ship. So we got out of the car and we're watching these things, they're not very high off the ground and very majestic, uh, nothing to be scared about, just an absolute privilege to be looking at these things. And as we watched, they disappeared into the ether. They went into a higher dimension. And so three nights later, we met with the Greers, and the first thing we said was, you know, you're not gonna believe what happened to us. And he said, that, that often happens to people he's meeting for the first time. It's sort of like they were checking me out. The book came out, and, and what, what came of all that was that I, not only agreed to, uh, I, I worked a deal with Stephen Greer so that um, we could try to get his information mainstreamed. So he he and I worked on his nonfiction book together called Unacknowledged, and, and mine came out a month later on, on disclosed the, the fiction area of it. And um, <laughs> we ran into definite, definite problems. There's the uh, the government within the government does not want this stuff going out. And I was on, I remember doing a radio show, um, I think it was in Chicago, a big radio station. And while we're talking, uh, they get zapped by a um, electrical current that knocks out the station hmm. and knocks off the call. They got me back on the call. I said, did you hear that? I said, no, I just, I just heard the dial tone. He said, uh, we got hit by some kind of EM, EMP uh, ray or some electromagnetic pulse. And then it happened again. They did not, they knocked us off twice. Hmm. So Greer, meanwhile, ran into all sorts of problems. He did a, a two hour interview uh, with the LA Times. I think it was the LA Times. And they, uh, and then, and they were told not to run it. Wow. So they don't want people to know something. It's crazy. I uh, at one point because we went down to Roswell, so we were talking about Roswell. Uh, we were looking at um, the JFK stuff. Like we were talking, and it wasn't even the conspiracy stuff on the JFK side. 
it was also around 9 11 so we were putting out our trade center stuff we were having a lot of issues with our youtube like all of a sudden like it was like throttled we couldn't post anything it was weird as stuff might be coincidence but <laughs> um but before we get back to sea monsters cove do you think megalodon's still out there well my my standard response for the last 23 years has been you know, we've only explored 5% of the ocean and 1% of the deep. So you can't tell me that Megalodon does not exist simply because we haven't seen it. Because sharks don't need to come up to the surface to breathe or show their telltale dorsal fin cutting across the waves. And so they could be in deep water. It's definitely possible. Plus, these aren't like dinosaurs, which died off like 65 million years ago, like the plesiosaur we were talking about. Uh, Megalodon was only started its reign about 28 million years ago, 30 million years ago. And depending upon who you talk to, only became missing, let's put it that way, in the last million years or so. So it's, you know, it's definitely possible. Yeah, anything, right? We know more about the moon than we do our own oceans. So with Sea Monsters Cove, what is the most exciting thing for you? Um, I think the most exciting thing is actually, I mean, everything is really cool, super cool with that, that site. Um, the, uh, all the structures have been designed so they can really function. But, but first you have to understand about the backstory. It's the backstory that, that runs through the, all areas of Sea Monster Code. And the backstory is that eight years ago, Dr. Max Rostan and his two colleagues were, were sent to uh, the Northern Mariana Islands to do some uh, field work, collect water samples and coral samples to measure the effects of climate change, global warming on these uh, islands. And now all the islands there are volcanic. They were all formed by the same forces that created the Mariana Trench. They all lie in a subduction zone. Subduction means that um, you have these two plates uh, that are lined up together, sea plates, and the bigger ones are going underneath the Philippine sea plate, which is very small. And when it subducts underneath it, it creates a trench, which is, it happens to be the biggest one, the deepest one in the world. But the entire Philippine sea plate is actually surrounded by trenches. It's a very unusual situation that's happening. And uh, so in my story, so they, they go to Mog Island. What's unusual about Mog Island is that um, Five million years ago, this volcanic island was basically just a giant volcano erupted. And the, the eruption was so violent that it destroyed the island. If you look at the map of Mog now, there's only three little islets which create sort of the rim. And the, the uh, magma chamber, which is in the middle, is now filled with water and it's a lagoon. So Dr. Rostan, Max for short, goes out there and they, and they dive to the lagoon and they discover that there is superheated mineral water coming up from the, um, somewhere below the island. And this is all true. Um, and while they're down there, uh, they, they come up and they, they go back to the research vessel and uh, another vessel enters the lagoon, uh, a fishing trawler. And in the trawl net is a, a huge whale that's thrashing around. And so because they're biologists, they want to stop the harm to the whale. So they sail over to the boat. And it, it turns out that they, the captain of the boat tells us it's a, it's a giant basking shark that is in labor, very pregnant, went into labor. It's panicking. And in its attempt to get out, it's sinking their boat. So they drowned it in the shallows. Now, Max uh, forces them to release the, the carcass. And he goes into the shallows and, and does an emergency C-section. And out of the womb of this, this huge shark uh, flops out 15 pups, uh, one albino and the rest dark pups. And they, they manage to save five of them and get these five pups back to their sailboat and put it in the wading pool that they're using for samples from the lagoon. But but Max is worried that, you know, the, these, these new pups are not going to be able to handle this high, warm mineral water. So he rushes to get to the Pacific Ocean, which is, of course, right inside the lagoon. And they release three of the five pups and they instantly die. 
they make it a you know a couple yards and and they flop over and sink. And then Max realizes that the the uh, Pacific Ocean is too cold for these sharks. That they must have since they're living they're the other two that are left over in the uh, sample tank are doing fine, which means that their prehistoric habitat much must be the same source of the lagoon water. Now they don't know it's a prehistoric shark yet. They go back and, and, and do a, a necro, necropsy, which is uh, an autopsy on an animal. They do a necropsy on the, uh, the mother and they realize this isn't a basking shark. This has you know huge teeth like a mako and it's 60 feet long. And so they realize they've come across a new species and the species has to be confined, these two pups have to be confined to the lagoon because wherever their mother came from, they're not gonna be able to get there as young pups. So the, the three scientists determine that, you know, they're going to raise these two sharks themselves. And so that's how the whole story starts with um, the albino is called snowflake. Uh, the dark shark is called Layla. And uh, for the first three years, his two colleagues raise these sharks, but then they get very big. And then they have to realize that they have to raise money to build some kind of aquarium facility that can use the lagoon water to keep these sharks alive. And in the process of finding their habitat, they locate a uh, primordial aquifer that's, loaded, that's located two miles beneath the seafloor. And uh, they're able to get down there and they discover that this aquifer not only has sharks in it, but it's got other sea monsters as well that date back 380 million years. And so now, you know, we have these aquariums in MOG uh, that showcase these animals to people. Yeah, I can't wait. Like I said, we're going to do our review, um, but I'm, I'm super excited. Um, and I can't wait to see what comes out in the future. Like you said, it's going to be evolving and... We get to kind of experience it like we're there, right? Absolutely. I'm excited. All right. So before we end this, uh, for people that want to learn more about you, where can people find out more about you, be it websites, Facebook, YouTube, wherever? Well, the easiest way is to go to SteveAlton.com. That's Steve, A-L-T-E-N.com. And my Facebook links are there. My social media links are there. But my personal email address is there as well. And um, as you know from your own experiences, I answer all my own email. Mm -hmm. I have been doing that for the last 23 years. Uh, it's how I meet, you know, interesting people like yourself. And, and you know, we help out each other. And and uh, and then, of course, Sea Monster Cove is www.seamonstercove.com. And you definitely want to get involved in that before the prices go up. But people who join now will be locked into the lowest price. It's like 30 cents a day. You know, it's ridiculous what you get for that. Yeah, it's super cheap. I signed up and I was like, well, this is nothing. It's like two Starbucks a week, you know. Less than that, Starbucks is so expensive. Uh, so, no, thank you so much. Uh, all your links will be in the, our uh, comment section down below. And I just want to say thank you for coming on here, talking about Mr. Cove, some other stuff. Thank you for getting me into reading. Well, thank you, Keegan. Appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. So thank you guys so much for joining us on another Cools Interviews. We do once again want to say thank you to Steve Alton for joining us today. And if you want to learn more about him or check out any things he's talking about, links are in the description below. If you want to see us review Sea Monsters Cove, well, just keep an eye on the channel tomorrow. Until then, if you want to see more Cools interviews, click the link to your left. If you want to see more of what we do at this channel, click the link to your right. And don't forget to like and subscribe.